And yet I want to talk today about God's process of healing. Jesus says, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's Matthew 5, 4. Loss is what creates pain and must be mourned. And I'm going to talk today about losses and what mourning is and how we resist mourning, what the opposite of mourning is, what kind of comfort God gives, and some practical helps and resources for mourning. To speak about this beatitude has been on my mind for a while, but it seems to fit after we heard again from Todd last week about a beatitude and, and because of this season in our lives, the pandemic, the continuing racial injustices, and now the war in Ukraine, among many other issues. When the Psalms speak of deep emotional pain, there's often a communal aspect to that. And there's a communal aspect to all these current social situations, these losses from the pandemic, losses from injustice, and the enormous losses of war, including the fear of what might be. But I'm gonna particularly focus on personal issues. And of course, the communal losses are also personal. Because as a now retired psychotherapist, personal losses are what I know. And I've worked through so many losses in my own life. I lost my childhood to sexual abuse and emotional neglect. I lost years of early adulthood to severe mental illness and depression. And yet, God has given me such grace to mourn those losses that they all seem long ago and far away. Frankly, I don't understand why I've been given such grace, such mercy, but I'm so very grateful. So I wanna to speak today about mourning and comfort, about emotional honesty with God and letting God go deep. Let me start with several thoughts about what mourning is and why, why we might wanna invite God into our deepest pains that pain that still has life in it, that pain that still hurts. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Today, I'm describing mourning as meaning to experience our emotions about a loss with Jesus. Loss is often related to trauma. Trauma is an event that exceeds our ability to cope, something that overwhelms us childhood abuse of any kind, which is a pattern of serious mistreatment is traumatic. Divorce and death are usually traumatic. And there are many nuances to those general categories. When we're traumatized, we can't at the moment experience the emotions, but at some point, we need to invite God into those memories so he can bring his healing comfort. And I realize I'm opening an enormous subject. But my goal this morning is to let the Lord speak to you about inviting him into these painful memories. And we'll each hear different things because the Holy Spirit speaks to us individually. But my concern is that we often do not mourn in the way that God blesses. We get stuck in pain or anger and never fully mourn with Jesus the losses of our lives. I ran across a quote recently from a woman named Nancy Hicks, whose son died of colon cancer last year. She says, the extent to which you enter into the depth of your pain with God is the extent to which genuine life is released in you. They are equal in measure. And I thought, yeah, that says it. There is a depth of genuine life, of the freedom Jesus promises us when we invite Jesus to meet us in the depths of our pain. So I want to encourage you if you're in that process of letting Jesus into your deepest pains, and I want to motivate you to engage in this process more fully if you have tucked away pain that needs mourning. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry, but sin not. Don't let the sun go down in your anger, lest you give the devil a foothold. There's usually some level of anger in that tucked away pain. Anger at the person who's hurt us, sometimes anger at God who's allowed that sin. 
or anger at God for setting up a system where free will can be used for evil. But anger is a cover for pain. Anger is a secondary emotion. Anger feels strong. The pain underneath makes us feel weak. But the call to mourning is the call to examine the anger in those deep pains, to feel our feelings in submission to Jesus. I spent 10 years working through my fury at my father because of the sexual abuse I had experienced at his hands in early childhood. One day in 1987, near the end of those 10 years of wrestling with God, I was in the midst of a situation where it had taken me a while to get in touch with some feelings. And I said to God, okay, here's a feeling for you. I hate my father, I'd kill him if I could. And I will hate him to my grave unless you deliver me. The comfort that God gave me in the intensity of that feeling and that confession to him was in the hope he gave. I began to hope that God might actually deliver me from a 30-year hatred. I began to hope, and he did. As I prayed daily for deliverance, I woke up one morning, one morning a few months later, and I said to myself, oh, it's gone. God has delivered me from that hatred. David's Psalm 6 um, in 6 to 10 in the ESV is another example of, of what mourning is. I'm weary with my moaning. Every moaning, every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. David pours out his heart in submission. And it's the in submission part that's crucial. There's no blessing in continually rehearsing our pain without submitting ourselves to God. Some of you might have read a recent blog entry called God is on the bathroom floor. Jane Marsuski was a singer songwriter known professionally as Nightbird. She performed last fall on America's Got Talent. I say was because she died of cancer this winter. She was 31. But a year ago, she wrote a magnificent piece of writing that says so well what I'm talking about. And this is very intense, but for some of us, this kind of intensity is where we need to be. Her husband had left her. The cancer treatments had really messed up with her brain. And she spent three months in anguish in the bathroom, barely able to function. She says, I am God's downstairs neighbor banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. I show up at his door every day, sometimes with songs, sometimes with curses, sometimes apologies, gifts, questions, demands. Sometimes I use my key under the mat to let myself in. Other times I sulk outside until he opens the door to me himself. I have called him a cheat and a liar, and I meant it. I have told him I wanted to die, and I meant it. Tears have become the only prayer I know. Prayers roll over my nostrils and drip down my forearms. They fall to the ground as I reach for him. These are the prayers I repeat night and day, sunrise, sunset. Call me bitter if you want to, that's fair. Count me among the angry, the cynical, the offended, the hardened. But count me also among the friends of God. For I have seen him in rare form. I have felt his exhale laid in his shadow, squinted to read the message he wrote for me in the grout. I'm sad too. She was deeply honest about her anger and despair. And she met with God on the bathroom floor and understood 
that he was weeping with her. And that's a key comfort that sustains me. He weeps with us. He's sad too. So there's a lot of different losses as we live our lives in this fallen world. There's the big ones I mentioned, abuse, divorce, death. But any sin against us creates loss. Some of us have lost opportunities because others have schemed to get ahead of us unjustly. Some of us lost a favorite car because someone else drove drunk. Some of us experience a loss of social capital because of arbitrary rejection. And just living in a fallen world creates loss. Some of us have lost children to cancer. Some of us have been born with some sort of genetic disability. Some of us have great dreams that are not gonna work out because of the limitations of this hard world. All of these kinds of losses need to be mourned and integrated because we all tell ourselves a story about our lives. We need to find a way to tell ourselves the story of our lives in a way that puts the losses into a context, a context that puts our losses in perspective. Our life altering losses such as abuse, divorce and death must be put into an eternal context. God is writing his story in history and our lives are small but significant parts of his big narrative. Ephesians 3.10 says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That seems to be saying that God is using his church to demonstrate his wisdom to the rebellious angels, those who've turned aside from God's goodness. We have a chance to participate in demonstrating God's goodness to the devil, incredible. And one of the ways we do that is to mourn our losses to the extent that we find God's redemption. And granted, sometimes losses don't find their redemption until eternity. But only through a genuine, vulnerable process of grieving and submission to God will we find the blessing and comfort of seeing God overlay our pain with his good. Even that statement might provoke anger. What do you know about the depth of my pain? You have no idea. How dare you? But I do encourage you to question even that anger. Why does this provoke anger? What's the anger about? What pain underlies that? Remember that anger is a secondary emotion. When we are in some pain or fear that feels too vulnerable, we cover it with anger or resentment or bitterness. And that's actually what happens to anger if we let anger persist. It hardens to resentment and bitterness. And those are dangerous feelings that need God's intervention. And remember Ephesians 4, which says long-held anger gives the devil a foothold in our lives. Long-held anger invites the devil into our hearts. Wow, what a thought. But it's akin to what God said to me when I first started opening up my emotional life to him at about 25 years old. He said, you have weeds in your heart. Let me pull them. Letting God pull those weeds of anger, plowing the hard ground of my heart, and letting myself feel all the pain underneath was worth everything it cost. Because we need soft, pliable soil to grow good fruit, or the fruit of the spirit won't grow deep. Our joy will be shallow, more related to addictions than the depth of joy that Jesus offers. And resisting mourning creates hard soil in our hearts, which can only grow weeds. Mourning is vulnerability with yourself and with the Lord. 
and sometimes with someone else, someone you know who will, will someone you know will weep with you. But mourning requires our willingness to invite God in, to take that memory off the shelf in that back closet and bring it out into God's light with him, to sit down with him and ask him to hold us as you feel that pain in his presence, to ask him to hear our confession that we are so angry with him for letting that happen. And we are so furious with the other person and that we feel so weak and inadequate that something must be wrong with us to have been treated so nastily, to weep with a deeper, deeper vulnerability. We tend to resist this kind of vulnerability, sometimes because we've grown up in families where vulnerability was taken advantage of. Our childish innocence was used against us by those who took their pleasure at our pain, or where open expression of pain was shamed we hear, what's the matter with you? Rather than come here, let me hold you. Tell me what's wrong. Or we resist because we think if I let ourselves weep, we'll never stop crying. In my years as a psychotherapist, I heard that several times, but crying tends to be self-limiting. Or weeping feels weak and weakness feels bad and weeping feels weak and weakness feels bad and shameful or we just don't trust God to meet us there. We wonder if he's really dependable. What if he's not enough? So we cover weakness and fear and shame with anger because anger feels strong or blame. We hold a grudge against others or against God or both. We're stuck on fury that God did not stop that death or the divorce, or the abuse. We are angry because it was other sinful choices that have had so much life-altering impact on us. And we are unwilling to give up the bitterness or the resentment, the anger. But Jesus says, we will be comforted if we mourn. Jesus says, if you let yourself feel the feelings of loss with me, you will be blessed. God himself mourned. Not only the famous Jesus wept scripture, that short and poignant verse, but also Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So God understands grieving losses. Grieving is part of what James means when he says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. That's James 4.10. Humility is a sober estimate of oneself. Humility recognizes who we really are. Humility is an openness to know every part of ourselves, including the hidden pain and resentment. The alternative to mourning is tucking away the pain in the back of a closet in your heart. For many of us, identifying the losses of this is the first step towards the comfort of God. And life is full of losses, big and small, the more we stay in touch with our emotional responses to those losses, the more quickly we can mourn and invite God into our experience so we can receive his comfort and find his redemption. And I listed several losses a minute ago, and you, of course, will make your own list. But I would encourage you to start with asking God, does this apply to me? Do I have tucked away pain that I need to examine with Jesus? What losses have I ignored? Or am I stuck in blame and anger and sadness? Am I quick to talk about times I've been slighted? 
the essence of a emotional and spiritual strength is well mourned losses. The antithesis of mourning is blame, especially blaming God, keeping him at arm's length because you're angry with him because of all those losses. How could you let my father take me to the cornfield that day to obliterate my trust? How could you allow my husband to walk away? Free will isn't worth what it costs. Forgiveness is closely related to mourning. Not all mourning requires forgiveness, though some does. But all forgiveness requires mourning. Sin against us creates loss. When we forgive, we are mourning a loss that has resulted from someone else's sin. And there are usually lies embedded in mourning. What's wrong with me that this happened to me? If I was perfect, I wouldn't have been hurt like that. God must be punishing me. Those are all lies. And if we don't seek God's comfort, we'll turn to other kinds of comfort. We'll seek the comfort of eating or smoking or sex or drugs or attention seeking or any number of other kinds of ways to soothe ourselves. Ways that only lead to more problems, not to God's comfort or redemption. I know I'm encouraging hard emotional work. If it were easy, we'd be further along. But that pain that is tucked away in the back of a closet is a way of leaking out into your life. Unless we find deep healing, we're quite likely to quite unconsciously create conditions that make other people feel like we do. We'll have a tendency to treat others the way we've been treated, especially how we were treated in childhood. If we felt abandoned, we'll abandon others in small and big ways, not responding to communications, up to cutting off friendships without co attempting conflict resolution. If we're shamed, we tend to shame. If we're ignored, we tend to ignore others. Only as we mourn and find God's comfort can we begin to assess our weaknesses without shame. Then we can enjoy more and more freedom from the weight of sin and grief and for behaviors that only recreate the sin that's been done to us. So that any pain we recall is a dead pain, a dead pain that feels long ago and far away, rather than a, rather than a live pain that feels like it happened yesterday. So I think that gives us a picture of what mourning is and how we resist some of the losses, what the opposite of mourning is, and about why we want to, might want to ask God if we need to do a deeper mourning. So what comfort does Jesus give in deep mourning? Because Jesus will meet us in the deep realities of our lives. He will speak. If we're willing, he'll give grace to release the anger. He will give perspective. He gives us a way to see our lives from his perspective. He helps us develop objectivity that our stories are part of his big story. And he will root out lies. It's in the depths of mourning that we realize the deep untruths we believe. Some of the lies I believed, I didn't believe God was good because I couldn't fathom that free will was worth what it, the evil that it had cost me. I believed I was worthless because I'd been an object, been used as an object in the abuse. I believed no one could be trusted, not even God, because if you can't trust your father, who can you trust? God has pulled all those lie weeds. He's convinced me that he's good, that I'm of immense value as his child, and that he and many others can be trusted. That's the comfort. The truth sets free. And there's that one piece of comfort that so sustains me. It's what Jane testified to, who wrote that piece about God being on the bathroom floor. I'm sad too, said. I can trust a God who suffers with me. That's the theme of my memoir, Trading Fathers. If you haven't read it, there are free copies in the foyer. 
there are free copies in the foyer, even if you have read it. At this point, at 70 years old, after much mourning, God has convinced me that the moment I walk through the pearly gates, I will glance around and say, oh, okay, I get it. C.S. Lewis says, he who alone can judge, judges the coming consummation to be worth it. Dostoevsky puts it in more poignant detail like this in the Brothers Karamazov. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent an infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity for all the blood they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. I believe mourning losses now helps us get to that place of childlike faith, that God knows what he's doing, that free will is worth what it costs, and that our first view of the kingdom fully come will justify all our pain. So to wrap up, here are some practical ideas. Pray for God to expose those closets of pain that need mourning. Determine to enter into a thorough process. Determine to work through by God's grace to the comfort that God means to give. Read insightful authors and seek out other materials. There are four I recommend, and I'll, I'll put these links on Google group, Groups this afternoon, so you don't need to remember, remember them right now. But a couple of books I've read kind of recently, Hope in the Dark by Craig Goschel and Prayer in the Night by Tish Harrison Warren. Pete Cazaro does a lot of work on emotionally healthy spirituality. And Deeper Walk International does a lot of work on, again, emotional health from a Christian, with a Christian point of view. So I'll put those resources up on Google Groups. So fourthly, pray daily for grace to grieve well. Take time every day to focus on the grief process. Ask for grace to give up the right to anger. It's not that we don't have the right. We do have the right but it's that we're being asked to give up that right as Jesus himself gave up the right for revenge. Ask for grace to believe that God will meet you, that he won't let you down like many others in our lives have let us down. I remember in my own process of mourning and grieving, thinking that he was asking what was the hardest to give, to believe that he would be different and other authority figures who had so hurt me. We need his help to trust him. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Unsent letters are a good strategy for getting about at how you really feel to write a letter to, to God or to a person with complete honesty, someone who's hurt you. No intention of sending it, just get it out into words. Let yourself write all that anger and sadness. No one, no one will see it. Even if you tear it up immediately so that you're sure no one will see it, it still is helpful to get, the, get your feelings into words. Because the act, just the act of putting feelings into words can be eliminating. Ask God to show you if there are lies that underlie some of your grief. Grief is often made worse because Satan has planted lies in our losses and tragedies. And ask God to convict you, us, of self-pity or blame or anger or resentment or bitterness or any other sin that might be mixed up into the grief. 
We think we can keep the pain at bay. We can tuck it away. But the only way to relieve the pain is to enter the pain with Jesus. The blessing is in the deep emotional honesty with God. That's where he meets us. God is ultimate reality. He meets us in reality. And that's where we find comfort. Suffering is meant to press us hard into God's heart. And we waste our suffering if we don't let it press us deep into him. Gethsemane is the quintessential model for grieving loss, facing the loss of life and imposition of unimaginable pain. Jesus lays himself open to the Father. He cries out for relief. He asks his Father to stop the process. And he submits and finds grace to endure all the way through to the resurrection. So in that resurrection power, let us go and do likewise in our loss and pain. We'll go to communion now. If you have the relationship with the Lord, we invite you to the communion table in the back. So Father, we ask for you as we lay ourselves open to you to clean us out, fill us up, especially as we meet you remembering the cross and the resurrection. We need more and more of your power, Lord, and more and more revelation of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, and minister to us. In your name, amen.